sea monsters, the stuff of nightmares. But for cameraman Bob Cranston, they're almost an obsession. He dives into the depths of the open ocean to encounter a creature called the Humboldt squid. His fascination with these beasts will send him into distant waters, into the lives of a strange and alien clan. They are masters of disguise. Their skin ripples with living light. Bob will seek out experts familiar with their ways. And he takes up a dangerous quest to connect with the fearsome Humboldt down in the dark. Do they flash a welcome or a warning? Deep in the waters of the Sea of Cortez, far below the sunlit surface, lurks a creature the locals call the Red Devil. It is armed and dangerous. Its writhing limbs come equipped with a thousand suckers, each full of flesh-tearing teeth. These devils come in the dark of night, rising from the abyss to within a few hundred feet of the surface. They are large, aggressive, in-your-face squid called the Humboldt. They're one of the most formidable predators in the ocean, and almost nothing is known about them. To cameraman Bob Cranston, the Humboldt have become an irresistible challenge. He's one of the few who've descended into their midst, at depths where others fear to follow. But his last encounter was a close call. It was three years ago in these very waters. Bob's goal was to film these beasts up close in the open ocean. The usual white filming lights create a circle of light that acts like a wall keeping the squid at bay. So Bob descended with red lights that diffuse almost immediately. Suddenly, the squid were too close. For an instant, it seemed they would tear him apart. It was an intense encounter that only fueled his fascination for the Humboldt. They came right for me with no fear. That got my adrenaline going. Suddenly I was really interested in everything about these guys. I wanted to meet more of their kind. Squid and their relatives live in every ocean. Getting to know the family will take Bob on quite a journey. And if diving with red devils is anything to go by, he'll need the help of some top-notch guides. Bob begins his quest far to the north in the dark, cold waters of the Pacific Northwest. In the maze of bays and inlets along the coast of British Columbia, there dwells the giant of its kind, but it's secretive and very hard to find. 
Bob's asked Dr. Peter Ward for help. Peter is a paleontologist and an expert on the origins of this creature. He has decades of experience in these waters, and there's no substitute for local knowledge. So, Bob, I got some maps of the underwater area we're going to go see tomorrow. Cool. And the nice thing about this, these are really high quality side scan sonars, and they give images in great detail from these. We can pick out caves or dens, really, where the creatures that we seek can be found. Face to face with my camera. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Bob's been filming underwater for more than 30 years. He's one of the best at very difficult diving. It's a rebreather, a closed circuit rebreather. The CO carbon dioxide is pulled out, add a little oxygen, it comes back and you breathe it. Same as the guys who walked on the moon. Fantastic. It's really cool. I can stay down there with the creatures and film them for as long as I can stay in the cold. The water registers 47 degrees. Without a dry suit, a diver could slip into unconsciousness from the cold in just half an hour. Waterproof zipper. Same zipper they use in spacesuits. Only in a spacesuit, I think they pressurize it. In this suit, you get vacuum packed. You get all these fancy lights. I think that one means low. Getting a little warm. Gotta get in the water soon. These gloomy green depths are called the Emerald Sea, and although cold, they are rich in oxygen and nutrients. The combination allows creatures to reach enormous size. Down at 60 feet, Bob and Peter pick up a trail of broken and discarded shells, a dead giveaway. Something strong and very hungry has come this way, and often. Crab should show more caution. It's up against a devious and determined predator. As Bob approaches, his quarry appears to have found him. A giant Pacific octopus. Eight arms of sinewy muscle lined with grasping suckers reach out and gently explore the strange intruder. A giant can reach 20 feet from arm tip to arm tip and weigh in at 200 pounds. It's the largest octopus in the great clan called the cephalopods the group that unites the octopus and squid. It's an ancient tribe, the first large predators in the sea. To this curious female, we're a brand new species. Cephalopod means head-footed, a good beginning in deciphering the octopus's amazing design. The head and body are encased in a large, soft sack, 
and the foot, derived from its distant relatives, the clams and snails, has become a siphon, a water jet to propel it in any direction. A long time ago, its ancestors wore a shell, but the octopus has given that up. Yet for creatures with such tasty flesh, the lack of protection presents a problem. The cephalopod solution, the most extraordinary skin in the animal kingdom. In an instant, it can change color, pattern, and texture. And with no bones to confine its shape, the creature can virtually disappear. Another female lies sequestered in her den, tending to her brood of eggs. She lays up to a hundred thousand just once in her life. When they hatch, she will die. These clever, curious creatures won't live long at all. Their entire lifespan is no more than three or four years. The transparent babies are no bigger than a grain of rice, but within a year, they'll be giants. While the lives of these complex beings are all too brief, their line reaches back 500 million years, long before sharks began swimming the seas. This would be a great spot right in here. Peter Ward has spent 35 years delving into cephalopod family secrets. He's brought Bob to a special outcropping of rocks. They were once well submerged in a much warmer sea and still hold a record of that long ago time. Fossils are found in these rocks, fossils of relatives of the octopus, actually. They're called ammonites. And how old are they? 80 million years in age. 80 million years. That's true. <laughs> that is old. Back in those days, cephalopods made beautiful curved shells. And if you dig long enough and hard enough, you can find some beautiful stuff. This is an ammonite. It's a fossil that is actually the direct ancestor of octopus. So this is a cool, an ancient cephalopod. It's related to the chambered nautilus, so the tentacles sat here and swam about. A shell is a mobile home and a defense against predators, but it's so cumbersome it makes swimming difficult. Of the almost 1,000 kinds of cephalopods alive today, only the Nautilus still wears one. It's a living fossil, puffing along the reefs of the Indo-Pacific as though nothing has ever changed. Bob returns for one last dive with the octopus. I couldn't resist bringing her a treat. All cephalopods are carnivores, and they love crabs. This creature actually reached out to me. I could sense her interest, her intelligence. I could see it in her eyes. There's something about the eyes of these animals just draw human observers in, and especially with the octopus and the cuttlefish, they definitely make visual eye contact with you and maintain it. Dr. John Forsyth studies these creatures' amazing physiology and complex behaviors. And I've come in and played games with octopus where I'll duck down, and they'll raise up and look at me, and then I'll raise up and they'll duck down, and this will just go on for 15 or 20 minutes. Like, this guy, I can barely see him over there, but... When I look up, up you know, see, he's coming up. Because I think they look for our eyes. I think they try to make contact with our eyes as well. 
And uh, I think that's what draws us into watching these animals. Whereas a fish, sometimes I look at a fish and I'm not sure where it's looking. They just have these blank, cold stares. But with a cephalopod, it's really never like that. At the National Resource Center for Cephalopods in Galveston, Texas, John maintains quite a collection. There are several kinds of octopuses, a school of small squid, and another relative, the cuttlefish. For John, the eyes of a cephalopod are not just the windows to its soul. They tell you a lot about how the animal lives. The octopus has a rectangular pupil that captures light reflected off the sea floor. Squid's large round eyes are adapted to seeing darting prey in the twilight of the open ocean. Cuttlefish dwell in both worlds, and their complex eyes can actually change shape to accommodate their travels. But it's not in their eerie eyes that cephalopods reveal their inner feelings. It's in their remarkable skin. Millions of tiny sacks of pigment called chromatophores dot their skin, each controlled by minute muscles. With a little flexing, a cephalopod can flash with rippling bands of color. Any sort of excitement, danger, desire, aggression, passion, and their skin lights up. For creatures with no vocal abilities at all, this is the way they communicate, in a language of light and color. And like an octopus, a cuttlefish can transform its texture, matching its surroundings, hiding in plain sight. Given their camouflage capabilities, it's no wonder we're still learning just how many kinds there are. One of the hot spots for new discoveries is the narrow Lemba Strait off North Sulawesi in the island chain of Indonesia. It's a pretty scenic spot. They've put for this joint, isn't it? I mean, it's magical. John and Bob have come here looking for new species of cephalopods. It's a place primed for strange adaptations. In the shallow, warm water, light and temperatures remain constant. But the channels, inlets, bays, and lagoons create many small separate habitats, and that leads to high diversity. This is John's fourth trip to Lemba Strait, and each time something surprising turns up. He's brought Bob to a spot called Ritaklari, which in local slang means the muck. At first glance, it's a vast, flat disappointment. But wait here quietly, and a lot of what looks like sand begins looking back. From the still of the muck to the roaring straits, a lot of effort goes into not standing out. Drifting reeds are actually floating razorfish. And the end of a few branches turn into ornate ghost pipefish.
Out in the high-speed tides and swirling eddies, fish work hard to keep their footing, digging into the bottom with spine-like fins. But even creeping along on the seafloor, you still have to make a living. A harmless-looking weed rolling in the current is a hairy frogfish trolling for a meal. It comes equipped with its own strange lure. The sand offers the best retreat, but the crab has already been spotted. A marginated octopus is the perfect little predator here. Good camouflage, good eyesight, good grip. The soft-bodied octopus has one more weapon up its sleeve to subdue the crab's claws, venom. It finds a chink in the crab's armor, injects a neurotoxin, and the struggle is over. In such an open setting, the trick for every creature is to find some place to hide. An octopus fits in just about anywhere, and John finds one tucked into a piece of discarded pipe. Perhaps there is something in cephalopod memory that recalls having a shell. Bob and John find this little octopus ambling along with a dark brown bottle tucked under his arms. The bottle turned out to be his home and he took it with him everywhere. So I thought I'd offer him a new fancy place and see if he's interested in trading spaces. began to worry he might get confused by this clear glass and wouldn't remember how to get back out. But after a few minutes, he slipped through the opening and went straight back to his old brown bottle. He'd made his choice. I think the clear glass was a little too bright. And besides, there's no place like home, especially when you can take it with you. In the husks of old coconut shells, they find the pearl-like eggs of one of John's favorite creatures. It's a tiny cuttlefish that's seldom seen after it hatches. It remains so small and well camouflaged that it takes great practice to find it.
Down on the sea floor, it appears to walk across the bright stones, its rippling colors blending in and standing out. It's called the flamboyant. The flamboyant cuttlefish is really in a class by itself, even among cephalopods in a lot of ways. First of all, the vibrant, dynamic, bright colors, the brilliant yellows, the magentas, uh, the pinks and, and browns. It adds on top of that these passing clouds of color as it's stalking, looking for prey. And of course, that's happening in living skin. A lot of these animals are surprisingly bold. The flamboyant actually seems to like being under the lights. It begins hunting as soon as we start filming. My video lights attract little shrimp and crustaceans. Perhaps the cuttlefish can even see better in the lights as well. It's only when John sticks out an enormous hand that we see the scale of this little hunter. Next to a six-foot Humboldt and a giant octopus, it's hard to believe it's one of the family. Not far away, a small octopus has been eyeing the scene. John reaches out for a better look. Every time I touch one of these animals, I'm not gripping it or holding it. My intention is never to frighten the animal in any way. However, I am trying to keep it close to where I can get a good look, but at the same time, the animal knows at any moment it, it can get away if it wants to. This octopus gets away all too soon. John thinks it may be a brand new species never seen before. I don't know, Bob. I'm not sure what that is, but it could be a new one. I think it could be a new species. I wasn't expecting to see that. It's not something you've seen before, huh? No, no. I'm not sure what that would be. It's a cool little critter. Oh, wild. The waters of Sulawesi are full of new discoveries, and one is an octopus designed with a special brand of disguise. It lives in the same waters as the banded sea snake, whose bold stripes announce its potent venom. These are banded arms that can make the same impression. When disturbed, the octopus flashes and intensifies the stripes, becoming a sea serpent, coiled and deadly. The creature has not yet been named by science, but it is known to be a fraud. It's a shy, nocturnal octopus. And unlike the snake, its venom is virtually harmless. Its stripes are simply a ruse to intimidate would-be predators. The real killer is a delicate, jewel-toned creature, the blue-ringed octopus. The flashing blue neon is no false alarm. Its poison can immobilize every muscle in the human body. There is no antidote. But all it's really after is a crab.
The Blue Ringed is notorious along the coast of Australia, but it's one of Dr. Mark Norman's favorites. As curator of marine invertebrates at Museum Victoria, his fieldwork in all seven seas has revolutionized what we know about cephalopods. It's really hard to estimate how many species of cephalopods or in particular octopuses we have worldwide because we're still in the period of discovery. They thought there was about 100 species of octopus in the world and we've found 150 new species in the last 10 years through the Indian and Pacific Oceans and Australia and up through Asia. And these groups of animals, it's not hard to find new species. Almost everything we touch is new. Bob wants to get close to the blue ring in the wild. So Mark, this is a shortcut to the beach? Yep, it's a great place to collect crabs. Through the graveyard, eh? Yep. <laughs> so are these the bodies of the people who have been bitten by blue ring octopus? No, very few people have died from blue ring bites. He's more likely to have died choking to death on his calamari meal at the local pub. <laughs> so this is where the crabs live? Yep, they hide up here at low tide under the rocks. As the guide to the blue ring, Mark starts Bob off with their prey. Lots of little crabs. Yeah. You need a nice juicy one. Uh, there you go. Do the claws on that. That'll take your arm off. It's an ironback crab. You can appreciate why the octopus has to get rid of the crab's claws as quick as possible. Knock them out. When the octopus bites them, it actually goes for those soft gaps in the junctions, like the elbows, where the, the arm is a bit thinner, or else they bite them right on the eyeball, and it, the poison goes straight down the eyeball and into the brain. So they end up paralyzing the animal instantly and putting these claws out of action. The dive begins after dark, when blue rings are most active. And it's not off some wild, remote beach. The deadly blue ring lives just beneath the town pier. Blue ring octopus are an extremely venomous animal, and if I was to be bitten, I would probably be, be dead within three minutes. Your body would start stiffening up and you'd lose the capacity to breathe, you'd lose the capacity to wave or walk or run away, you'd run out of oxygen and you'd suffocate. But these little animals are really shy, really secretive, and the last thing they want to do is attack humans. They don't eat humans, they don't drag people out of their cars and drag them down the beach. They just Feed on crabs. But tonight, not even a crab could catch its attention. This is a male, and he's just found a female. Two wild blue rings are preparing to mate. They keep their colors subdued to avoid attracting attention, especially from competing males no flashing their electric blue. A temporary aquarium helps Bob film what happens next. After a few minutes of courtship, the male gently slips a special arm into the female's gill slit. He's depositing a packet of sperm, which she will use later to fertilize her eggs. It's the end of their relationship, and most likely the end of his brief life. That was all he needed to accomplish. Just beneath the very same pier is another cephalopod almost never seen in shallow water. New research finds that they too pack a poisonous punch, but their bright little stripes have earned them a harmless nickname, the pajama squid. I think these cephalopods are the closest to the cartoon characters. Their little black and white suits and their little frilly lashes behind their eyes and the yellow on the top of the eyes, they're just straight out of a comic book.
the pajama squid seemed to have taken a cue from the blue rings. Males grab any passing female and then they try as hard as they can to reposition them so that they're face on ready to mate, sort of suckers to suckers. The mating season is also picking up off Australia's southwestern coast. In one small bay, giant cuttlefish have begun to assemble. They leave deep water and enter the shallows once a year for three to four weeks. The males are three feet and massive with eight flowing arms and one all-consuming purpose. A much smaller female takes refuge in the rocks. The males waste no time taking on their rivals. They flash and ripple with aggression. Their control is so subtle that they can isolate and flex just the flank facing the opposing male. The other flank communicates a solid, dependable side to any nearby female. One male has claimed her and takes possession. He'll guard her now, keeping her beneath him until she is ready to lay her eggs. Jules, you around here somewhere? Bob is heading for this far-flung coast, but before diving with these giants, he needs to brush up on the subtleties of cuttlefish communication. This is a crazy place to meet a scientist. Julian Finn is a leading expert on the intense social dynamics of the cuttlefish. He comes to this junkyard to scrounge up special equipment for an interesting experiment. Hey, Jules. I have read, Bob. Oh, OK. Oh, there you go. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, uh, you into old cars? Stuff. Oh, yeah, I love them. I've got a, got a number of old cars and uh, plenty of treasures in this place. Cuttlefish well, speak a visual language, place, huh? yeah, and sure. Julian wants in on the conversation. Cars, but, um, also, I got a few ideas about uh, making something to use on these cuttlefish in Moala, trying to get a bit of a different shot. So, Looks like junk to me. <laughs> Meanwhile, the cuttlefish continue to gather. Their complex communication escalates into a kaleidoscope of colors. Opponents toss each other in the rolling tide, and things start getting rough. The violence can rip up their all-important skin, sabotaging a male's chance to impress and intimidate and someone's nursing a torn-off tentacle. In a temporary standoff, a large male guards his female from two other heavyweights, while a little male, too small to take seriously, hovers on the sidelines. The two males on shore get set to join the fray. Well, here you go, Jules. I just wanted you to know that my camera's bigger than yours. Mine's a bit different than yours, too. Well, yours has a hubcap on the front of it. <laughs> what I'm hoping to do is film the male's reaction to another male. But instead of having another male there, I'm going to have its reflection. It's when males are the same size that trouble starts. And Julian will present one with its very own reflection. He's studying the displays and the intense competition. 
he intends to provoke a fight. He approaches a large male who immediately responds. The cuttlefish becomes increasingly absorbed with his own image, but instead of a conflict, the story takes a surprising turn. The small, unimpressive male has sneaked in and begun mating with the unguarded female. He's not signaled, nor flashed, nor dazzled. He simply grabbed the female for his own, making every attempt to look as much like her as possible. The aggressive male makes no headway with the mirror and finally moves off to resume his duties. But he's still distracted, still flashing, and doesn't recognize that his female is mating right under his nose. The little male looks so like another female, he doesn't see the threat. At last, he senses something's wrong and moves in to reclaim his female. To re-establish their relationship, he presents her with the gift of a crab. With so much going on in cuttlefish society, Julian will be experimenting for a long time to come. Julian's attempt to interact with the cuttlefish and crack their code has given Bob a daring but dangerous idea. Deep in the waters of Mexico, the mighty Humboldt squid flash their own mysterious signals, and Bob is determined to dive with them again. He intends to engage these aggressive predators by imitating their behavior with a display all his own. Mark Norman and Julian Finn think he's close to crazy. Sure, you've got the blooming octopus that can kill you within a few minutes with the poison, yet there's something scarier about a squid that can rip off your flesh and tear out your throat, so to speak. I think you'd be really sensible to work with shark cages with those animals because the stories I've heard and they're these massive animals that will effectively skeletonize a cow in a minute because they're such voracious predators. Bob Cranston has no intention of taking this advice. His whole goal is to interact with these squid on their terms in their world. In the small town of Santa Rosalia, on the edge of the Sea of Cortez, being a fisherman takes a certain courage. We lose people you know, every other year, somebody, somebody dies. Uh, we had a friend uh, that uh, they found floating in the ocean uh, uh, last year. Uh -huh. It's lucky they found him because, yeah. you know, they're carnivorous. They'll eat, they'll eat you. I mean, they will eat you. The squid will eat you. The squid will eat you. If you fall into the ocean, they'll get you with their tentacles, you'll drown, and then they'll, you know, all the rest of them will just eat you. Despite their dread, these fishermen face the Humboldt on a nightly basis. Bob will need their help if he hopes to find when and where the squid are rising. Alberto. When the Humboldt flash on and off, Bob intends to flash right back. As you don't say. <laughs> this is a flashlight, big flashlight for squid. We're gonna 
This is loco, see? Bob knows, perhaps better than anyone, just what Humboldt are capable of. But it's not fear that he feels. It's an intense fascination for such alien creatures in a world so different from our own. For me, there's just something about these animals. Maybe it's because this type of diving in itself is a great challenge. It's hard to work at these depths. I've managed to go down and physically touch these fantastic creatures. But somehow, they're the ones that have taken a hold of me. He's 12 miles from shore. Aside from his assistant cameraman, there'll be no backup down below, and no source of help at all topside. There's not so much as a radio on this little boat. These are small boats. It's a big ocean. There's a language barrier between me and the fishermen who think I'm crazy to dive in the water anyway. If I disappear and drift away from this boat, the fishermen will just think the squid ate me and they won't even bother coming to look for me. Yet Bob has confidence in his own experience and in his plan. I've made up this light tube and filled it with strobe lights. The idea is that the Humboldt squid flash for communications. They flash at each other, they flash at the divers, and so I hope to elicit some kind of a reaction from these animals with this light tube. Beneath the boat lies a thousand feet of open water and sea monsters. descends, his homemade lightsaber a beacon in the utter darkness. Right away, there's a complete surprise, mobula rays. They're seldom seen in a school like this. Already, the night has taken on unexpected possibilities. With his depth gauge reading 150 feet, Bob figures he's in squid waters. He powers up. A giant swarm of pink krill mobs the lights. Suddenly, Bob's in the middle of a midnight feeding frenzy. Then, rocketing up from below, Humboldt squid. flashing red and white. Bob tries to get clear of the krill into better visibility. And he's caught the squid's attention.
I'm transfixed by this enormous eye up from the deep. I can sense this creature thinking, but I can't imagine what. A minute later, contact. The squib grabs hold, testing the light the only way it can. The feel of hard plastic must come as a surprise, and it circles me as though curious. Then it comes back for more. This time, the aggression is gone. It just seems interested. Amazing. We play for a moment. Then suddenly, it's over. Fishermen are relieved just to see me alive, but I climb back in the boat knowing something remarkable has just happened. I danced with the devil down in the deep, and I'm already thinking about the next dive. It's certain that Bob will return to dive again with the mysterious Humboldt, perhaps with a new strategy on how to make contact. He's just at the beginning of this extraordinary quest. But who will he meet next time in the waters below? Friend or foe? To learn more about what you've seen on this nature program, visit pbs.org.